and welcome to Military History Inside Out. In today's episode, I speak with David Ball, who has translated a diary um, that covers 1940 to 1944 France. The writer Leon Vert was in the countryside at this time and talks about daily life and also the liberation of Paris in 1944. Thank you and enjoy. I'm speaking with David Ball, translator and editor of Leon Worth's Deposition 1940 to 1944, A Secret Diary of Life in Vichy, France. Thank you for speaking with me. Glad to be here. Thank you. So first, tell me, how did you um, get into studying and translating uh, this type of work? When I got out of college, I had the good fortune to get a Fulbright fellowship to France, all expenses paid, study for a year. Uh, I had absolutely no intention of studying. The French I knew, I think I got it because my French professor lied about how little I, French I knew. They claimed I knew French very well, which I didn't. But as soon as I hit France, I fell in love with it for some reason. It's absolutely inexplicable. I don't know why. I could hardly understand the language. I just loved everything about it. And I stayed on for 10 years. Uh, and little by little, I began going to classes at the university simply to maintain my student card because the university restaurants, as they called them, they were cafeterias, cost about 20 cents a meal. And it let me hang on and do odd jobs and earn my living there. Um, and then little by little, I started going to classes because you do have to pass exams to keep up your card. Mm -hmm. And to cut to the end, uh, 10 years later, I got a job at Smith College in Massachusetts. And uh, I was by then married with a woman I met at the Sorbonne, French woman, and we had a little baby. And I became a fr professor of French, but after that, lived for five more years in France. And as I lived there, I was struck by the shame the French felt starting in around 1962 with Ophuls' film, The, the Chagrin et la Pitié, The Sorrow and the Pity, mm -hmm. and Robert Paxton's classic book on Vichy, France, the shame many French felt, not all, about their collaborationist government during World War II, and I got fascinated by that story. Mm -hmm. When I was teaching French, I also got more, interest, more and more interested in literary translation. I translated a great, weird French poet named Henri Michaud, for example. Mm -hmm. But my last two books have been First, Diary of the Dark Years by Jean, Jean Guéhenno, which is, he was a Paris intellectual, and this is mainly a diary about cultural collaboration and resistance in Paris. And then this long, great diary by a man I call Léon Vert. I'm sorry, it's his French name, and you work with him that much. Mm -hmm. I can't say it anyway. Vert, it is worth in English, W-E-R-T-H. Mm -hmm. uh, and that diary is about daily life in the countryside. And in a moment, I can tell you why he was in the countryside and not in Paris where he normally lived. Mm -hmm. So that's the long story. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the book then. Since you were a translator and editor, how, how did you decide what material to use and what not to use? That's a great question. The book is about 750 pages long in, Fran in French, mm -hmm. and he was, well, I'll say it now, he was Jewish, and so he was holed up in his non-Jewish wife's country house in a little village in eastern France mm -hmm. while she worked in Paris, and he had nothing to do all day, and he was a writer. He had published 12 novels, uh, some books of political and cultural criticism in, I think it was 1926, he did a book on a trip to what is now Vietnam, then a French colony, and he spoke, he, he related how terrible the French were treating the Vietnamese. They didn't call them Vietnamese then. So he, he's a writer who has nothing to do but stay in the house. So what did he do? 
He wrote about books he was reading. He wrote about his thoughts about the Bible, about God. Not much about God because he didn't believe in God, but that kind of thing. Books that nobody said he ever heard of. And he noted what the peasants were saying, what people in the village were saying, what the Vichy press was saying, what he could hear on the radio. And that's both English radio and French radio. So it seemed to me that that those hundreds of pages about books no one has cared, no one knows about today were not worth keeping. Mm -hmm. Whereas his notes about daily life really are. It's an absolutely great diary mm -hmm. about Vichy France. So how does it compare? So the other book that you translated, The Dark Years, that cover the yep. same time period, um, I'm not familiar with that one. Can you just mention it and compare it to um, to this one? Sure. Um, Diary of the Dark Years was written by a man who taught, uh, it's hard to, do, to describe the equivalent, he taught elite sort of postgraduate high school classes who were preparing for a great exam to get into the most elite, one of the most elite schools in France. And when you say elite in France, you don't mean money. You mean, because the state pays you if you get the exam, you mean the cream of the French intelligentsia, really. In fact, they pay you if you get in. So he taught French literature and culture there. And he kept teaching, but he refused to write. And he, too, was a writer, although not a novelist. He wrote um, political journalism mostly of a sort of high quality and he poured his cultural feelings into the diary and he talked about intellectual life in Paris and he was particularly angry at his fellow writers and political writers who went on blithely publishing under a Nazi controlled press mm -hmm. and so he resisted internally and then toward the end of the war, got together with other writers in what came to be called the intellectual resistance. So it's a very high, and he writes in a very high literary style, very eloquent. Welt, mm -hmm. in the countryside, is completely different. He writes not slangy French, but very lively um, French. Not, he doesn't try to be eloquent. He's just sharp and tough. Mm -hmm. Very anarchistic man. Uh, and I be gladly say a little about that in a moment mm -hmm. um and he's not that much interested he doesn't even know what's going on in the capital in paris as far as intellectual life goes he's curious about the peasants around him the farmers i call them peasants because they're so different from american farmers mm -hmm. the french word is paysan like peasant mm -hmm. so he's curious about them about what the village people are thinking and he sees the restrictions that Vichy is putting on life in all spheres, plus the glaring fact that he's Jewish. Mm -hmm. And if he were picked up, he would be deported, mm -hmm. quite simply. And it was Vichy that began, that is the collaborationist French government, that began the measures against Jews, not the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So was he just an observer, or did he ever participate in any resistance more uh, yeah. violent resistance activities. Yeah, that's a, that's another great question. Neither he nor the author of the other the great diary, the one in Paris, Jean Guéno, neither he nor Guéno were in the resistance as we think of it. That is, they did not smuggle messages to the British. They didn't, you know, walk around hiding with machine guns. Nothing like that. No, uh, for a number of reasons. For Guéno, he was simply too well known. They knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, it would be a folly to be in a resistance group. Vert is different. He's 62 years old. Very few people of that age entered the resistance. And even though he notes resistance activities and he clearly has contacts, he just never really gets into it. And sometimes he thinks, gee, I should have done this, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. So, yes, he's an observer, but a very committed observer and a sarcastic and ironic observer. So he would have known, he would have had an idea of who was in the resistance or who was participating, wouldn't he, or was it? Uh, around him, yes. He didn't know that much about the national resistance. Mm -hmm. No, he couldn't have. Right. Uh, sure. But as far as... Um, 
I, I guess it, was he in the village under an assumed identity or was he? No, no, that's very interesting. Um, nobody turned him in. Uh, they must have known he was Jewish. No, everyone knew him in the village because it was his wife's summer home. They'd been going there for years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like to tell you how he came to write the diary, really, how he came to be in that village, if, if that interests you. Oh, definitely. Okay. So he and his wife, in June of 1940, when what the French call the debacle, the debacle is beginning, that is the rapid loss, the fall of France, right? Germany in, in six weeks just destroys the French army. Mm -hmm. And no one at the time understood why. And today we know there's one answer, and the answer is military incompetence mm -hmm. by the French. But people are panicked. There are, about, there are millions of people on the roads fleeing toward the south, before the German advance. Uh, it's not totally rational. I mean, it's not that the Germans had already committed atrocities. They did not, really. Certainly not at the beginning. Uh, but that's what happened. It, the French call it the exodus down south. He and his wife set out for their country home for what should take, at the time, with a car that's slower than ours and no highways, really, just roads, it should have taken four to five hours. It took them 33 days <laughs> to get down to the country. And he wrote a book about it, a sh short book, which was published in English, called 33 Days. Okay? When he, as soon as he could write, and he had taken notes along the way, and he describes that exodus. He gets into the country house. And as I say, nothing to do. And then he starts writing every day in his diary. And that's the diary I edited, cut a lot, and translated. The title is his deposition. Mm -hmm. Because, in other words, what he's saying is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. So I would, um, I'll make a point and, and I'll make it just so maybe you can comment on how he might have approached it, Leon. Um, which is, I would say that French army was not so much destroyed as it was corralled, that uh, certain main uh, command structures were, were destroyed, but a huge amount of the French army still was, was viable, and yet they couldn't work, you know, like two million men, I've, I've been told, uh, French soldiers were, were just basically captured. Um, That's right. And I, I would think that feeds into the national embarrassment, so to speak, Um did Leon in the diary? Was there any commentary on that, or uh, not much? But um, if you look at the beginning of Jean Gano's diary, it's a very eloquent beginning, mm -hmm. uh, railing against Pétain's surrender and talking of exactly what you said of the humiliation of this defeat and this surrender, and and especially signing the armistice. Like you could have said, okay come in, we have to lay down our arms because our army is being cut to pieces. By the way, it wasn't nothing. In six weeks, the French lost between 50,000 and 90,000 men, mm -hmm. at least twice that number of wounded. That's not nothing. Mm -hmm. But the reason is, as you described, the army was cut to pieces because the generals had no idea what to do once the Germans had crashed through the Alden in, in the north of France through the Belgian through the Belgian border. Mm -hmm. They weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. It was supposed to be impenetrable. I'm sure you know that, right? Everyone knows they built the Maginot Line mm -hmm. and the Germans simply went around it. They didn't try to cross the Maginot Line, which was state of the art equipment. Mm -hmm. Why bother? So when that happened they had no alternate plan. They didn't know what to do. And so the the army was disorganized and cut into pieces. Now, did Vert understand that? Not really. No one understood that. But he, like Gano, was ashamed. And what he does is simply record not an eloquent response, shame on you and de Gaulle at least has pride. Nothing like that at the beginning. He simply records the total confusion in the village around him. Everyone has an explanation, which is totally wrong. So that's his relations, if you will, to the crushing defeat. But you're right. The two feelings of the French were actually, one should say, relief because mm -hmm. the war was over for most of them. Mm -hmm. Right. 
20 years ago in World War I, they had lost 1.3 million with 4 million casualties. Mm -hmm. So, okay, at least we didn't lose that. And, as you say, shame. And both of those, they come up more in Guéhenot than in Vert. Vert is simply ironic. He's tougher than Guéhenot in a certain way mm -hmm. that he said, look what we got. Yeah. I, yeah, I didn't want to minimize French losses, but it seemed that it was more just confusion that, you know, and, and outmaneuvering that led to the downfall rather than material destruction. Yes. As I said, it can be summed up in two words, military incompetence, not mm -hmm. of the soldiers, of the generals. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it was these people who governed France for the for four years that were to come, the main general, Pétain, and then his underlings. Did uh did Vert um, comment uh, when, when Germany invaded Poland? Um, I believe there was some, you know, the French. There was some skirmishing on the border. There was some concern about uh, the Germans turning towards France. Did he comment? Is there any commentary back from 1939 at all? I guess not. No, no, not at all. Yeah. Okay. And you know, when the Germans, cra it was May 10th, 1940, where the Germans crashed through the Alden Forest with their tanks. Mm -hmm. which they weren't supposed to be able to do. But that's at the end of six months of theoretically war. The French call it le drôle de, la drôle de guerre, the phony war, mm -hmm. or the funny war, literally, uh, because there was really no firing. And then so, what well, happened, of course, the Germans were preparing this attack, and the French were not preparing any solid defenses because the Germans weren't supposed to go there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the high command again, which was so incompetent. Yeah. No, that doesn't comment on that. That's not in the diary. What are the exact uh, dates that the diary covers for the range? Uh, let's see. The diary starts, I would say, the end of June. Let me check the exact date. It starts the end, I'm sorry, it starts the end of July 1940, mm -hmm. and it ends at the liberation of Paris. And let me say a word about that. Sure. So he's, Vert is, is holed up, hold up in, in this little village. But he leaves the village in January 1944 because his wife tells him that the concierge, the equivalent of the janitor, I suppose, the super in a, in a, in a, in a, in a let's say, a, an American city apartment house, has knows her and said she won't say a word to the police so that he won't be picked up. Hmm. So in January 44, he goes back to Paris. Now, that means he's in Paris for when the American troops and British troops are ha, have landed in Normandy, and particularly the last days of August, when there is an uprising in Paris with the American army at the gates of Paris in actual fact. But nonetheless, the, the French liberated Paris. The, one could say the American army let them liberate Paris, and that's the truth. Mm -hmm. But from their point of view... It was their fighting, their uprising that finally got the Germans out. And he describes that. So it's in that part, you have a an eyewitness account of the fighting. And if we can, at the end, I'd like to read you some of that. It's very exciting. I'm um, sure. Let me ask about the, the translation. I, I'm always curious about um, sort of the slang words that exist in um, in any culture, and especially in this wartime environment. Um, can you talk about any difficulties or, or what it was like to translate his works, his words? Sure. I'll give you just one detail first, and I, I've already mentioned it. Uh, the French word for farmers is paysan, which looks like peasant, right? And um, it's often translated today as farmer, and that's a good translation. That's normal because peasant implies something sort of backward, right, and European, you would never say that for an American farmer, for example. Mm -hmm. My first decision was, this is a word that comes up again and again, am I going to translate that as farmer? And I thought, no, because a farmer suggests someone driving a tractor over plains in a wheat field or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that these they, there were no tractors then, and certainly not in France. They, I mean, they may have been in the States. Uh, a, a European farmer at that time is closer to what we think of as a peasant. 
Now, in other words, I was thinking of what does this suggest to an American reader in English? And that's what I thought of for each sentence in each word that I translate. What's the tone of this sentence? Now, this tone is often tough and ironic, and I'd like to give an example of that in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes simply flat reporting, and I want a flat style there. Uh, often sarcastic, and I have to get that. And it's written in sort of, how can I put it, not slangy French, but not eloquent, straight French, except at the very end, and I'll read that passage where he gets eloquent about that final parade down the Champs-Élysées where de Gaulle leads the sort of victory parade. Mm -hmm. um, but just before that, you have very different tones. So my, my job then is getting his lively, changing tone and slang was not really a problem. Uh, for the previous diary, Guéano, the problem there was getting his very eloquent, highfalutin French. So they're two very different books, and I tried to make my English very different. Mm -hmm. So let me hear an example of what you're, you're talking about then. Okay. Um, and this will get into the spirit of the man of who he was. Mm -hmm. He's writing this in December 12th, 1940. Now, just let me give you a little bit of background. He's well aware then that in October 1940, Vichy, the French government, which the Nazis allowed to stay because they were collaborating, the French government issues its first decree giving Jews a special status, special, that is, they cannot exercise the liberal professions, lawyer, doctor, they can't participate in public life in any way. Uh, there's a whole series of restrictions. And then another edict, a little bit later, saying they have to register as Jews, and so forth. And this, of course, made it very easy for the Nazis to deport them. The uh, um, Okay. He's writing in December 12th, 1940, and here's an entry. This is what he takes the time to write, quote, I have never voted, not out of principle or laziness, nor, as one might think, because of my police record. But every time I thought of registering, I was stopped by my horror of the corridors in barracks, prisons, or administrative office buildings. Those Parisian buildings are just too depressing. If I'm not a registered voter, it's the architect's fault. Okay, now here the tone is sort of snotty and frivolous, and I tried to get that. Mm -hmm. And he's proud of, of maintaining his anarchistic spirit. Mm -hmm. right? uh, I'll give you one example, uh, which is, has a slightly different tone. This is, he records in the paper, uh, Monsieur de Gaulle, and then he says that's what the paper calls him, because he's General de Gaulle, of course, right? Monsieur de Gaulle and General Catrou have been stripped of their French nationality, quote unquote, from the paper. So has France. <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> yeah. Now, the, 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 the translator's problem was how to get this very concise French. He just said, la France aussi. Mm -hmm. Literally, France also. So, of course, I said, so has France. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. So, so yeah. tell me then, um, what kind of man was he? Okay. Well, yes, he had an anarchistic spirit. Uh, he was way on the left, but he, he had sympathy for the communists, but he would never join the communist party or any other party. Uh, as I say, he, when he visited French Indochina, uh, of course he wrote a book, which made the French think that he had contacts with dangerous revolutions, so he was investigated by the equivalent of the FBI, and he did not have contacts. He just described what he saw. So he was extremely critical of all French governments and of Vichy. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> and his point was that when they signed the armistice, this was supposed to be, you think of an armistice as being a temporary arrangement, he says, but we didn't realize that we're, we were settling into fascism. So his spirit then is critical, ironic, but also sympathetic to the peasants around him. He, he notes the way they react and, and what they say. Okay, and sometimes with amusement, sometimes with sympathy. Mm -hmm. uh, once he says about the, 
the farmer living next to him, the peasant living next to him, that he would probably be happy at an English victory. Uh, this is early in the war. At an English victory, if it were handed him on a silver platter. And in fact, he would probably give them a cow, uh, his least productive cow. <laughs> so, you know, that, uh, people generally think, you know, someone, a peasant, is very conservative and would, uh, you know, perhaps be supportive of these, you know, very sort of xenophobic conservative values that were being pushed by the the collaborationist government, but it sounds like, at least in this village, it was more of a live and let live, you know, the people weren't worried about his being Jewish and, and his sympathies, it seems. So I'm trying to get a sense of, of that that uh, dichotomy. Yeah. Um, what he records is that they just ignore Vichy. It has, what they say is, what Vichy says is meaningless to them. They don't like the restrictions on how much they have to produce. They don't like the fact that what they produce is going to the Germans. Mm -hmm. And they have no trust whatsoever in the government, period. <laughs> uh, and little by little, they're for de Gaulle and against Pétain, although Pétain, you often have the attitude, and this is an attitude that persisted for a long time, well, it's not his fault. He's doing the best he can. But the government, no, no, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. Laval, who is Pétain's prime minister, uh, is hated universally. And in fact, he was one of the first to be executed at the liberation. Mm -hmm. So it seems that despite the, the, the huge gap in educational levels, um, Vert was very connected with the people, you know, like the sympathies were almost the same in a sense. Yeah, he is connected with the people around him. He knows them. Uh, he does complain that he that he has no friends here. He's totally alone. Mm. Uh, but little by little, he he comes closer, especially to the people in the village who have who really sympathize with the resistance. One of them, for example, hands out illegal leaflets. Uh, and he's an old chairmender called Old Francois. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd, I'd like to tell you how he, what's mixed into that is how he reports the war and the progress of the war. Mm -hmm. Since I know this is war inside out, I mostly focused on that actually in, when I was, you know, thinking, thinking about this podcast. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so let me go here. Let me go into how he, how Vert reports the war. First of all, he's aware that, like people today, he's hearing about terrible events at a distance. This war is not taking place on French soil until the Normandy landing, right? And the Normandy landing fills them with tremendous hope. That's quite different. So here's what he says. He's listening to the radio. The radio. Bombs, shells, bullets, cannons, planes, machine guns. Stalingrad the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, Libya, Indian Plains over Italy and Germany. Real men, not men made of communiques and news flashes, kill and die. I'm alone in my room in front of the big radio. The war comes to me stripped down, cleaned up. The wounded don't bleed. The corpses are statistical. I'm above the war like an old, tired god. But Sometimes, when there's the Allied landing in North Africa, that's the 8th of November, 1942, listen to this note. I was vaguely listening to the radio through the scrambling. I wasn't expecting anything. And I hear, landing, North Africa. I'm alone in the universe and the radio waves in the center of an invisible world of sound. I have a childish image of this landing. I see boats, planes, oranges, Arabs, and blue-eyed Americans. <laughs> the French used to think that all Americans had blue eyes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this sudden piece of news comes to me like an inspiration to the prophets. No one was there, and yet someone spoke. I feel like calling, shouting, communicating the news to the people. I'm sure I'm the only one who knows it. The Americans began landing during the night. But at this very moment, a quarter past nine in the morning, they're still landing. 
the English news bulletin isn't talking in the past tense, but in the present. They're landing at this very minute. It's not a cold piece of news. It's not a piece of news that has slept even for one night, even for a few hours. The Americans are landing in Algeria, so to speak, right before my eyes. Nothing has been so rich in hope since the debacle. Quote, he's quoting, a historic turning point, a new phase. Already it seems to me that between the debacle and this landing, time has contracted. When the radio announced the defeat of Trump of Rommel's troops, that that's the Battle of El Alamein in, in Egypt, where uh, Rommel's troops broke through the German lines and forced a retreat, right? Mm -hmm. And the news got through. So let me go back to this. When the radio announced the defeat of Rommel's troops, old Francois drank a glass of white. Mm -hmm. I think today he'll drink two. <laughs> so he seems very aware of war what um do you know what his experiences during world war one or or any wartime yes. experiences beforehand were yes uh he wrote two semi-autobiographical novels about his experience in world war one and it, it's kind of odd because he was a pacifist and he didn't believe in the patriotic fervor about the war and he certainly didn't believe that it was a war to end all wars but he enlisted anyway, just out of solidarity with the men who were fighting. Hmm. And then he became increasingly disgusted by the whole thing. He was also wounded in the war, but he recovered totally. Hmm. And that's his experience in World War One. So he has a character named Clavel in his two novels about the war, which have not been translated into English. Um, and the result is a disillusionment with the war and with everything around it, which is absolutely typical of, of anyone writing and thinking in France and most of Europe. Mm -hmm. It seems that those World War I novels would be interesting in, in English. Um, I'm surprised they haven't been translated. Yeah, so am I. Um, tell, that to, tell that to some publishers. I'd love to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, especially, you know, with this being the 100-year anniversary of the, the ending of that war. Um, yeah. And let me tell you how, he, if you like, let me tell you how he records the Battle of Stalingrad, which, after all, is one of the great turning points of the war, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's very interesting because Guéano living in Paris and reading the, the Paris French press, which was essentially the German Nazi press, written in French, mm -hmm. right, by French by Frenchmen who collaborated, uh, whereas Werth's papers were controlled by Vichy, which was less, uh, how can I put it, a little less virulent than the Nazi daily press in Paris. So that's where he read it. But they all have the same news about Stalingrad. And he simply records it as, here we go, um, October, this is October 4th, uh, 1943. Uh, the Russians are hanging on. Stalingrad. Stalingrad is the center of the war. The feeling we have about everything else is it can wait. It's from the Russian front that we'll see the first signs of German collapse. And then he has a note about it about a month later in passing. And then February 1st, 1943, when you have the report of the end of the Battle of Stalingrad, Right. And a tremendous event, the destruction of a whole German army. This is how he reports it. February 1st, Russian communique. By the way, it would be interesting to know where he got that Russian communique. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine from English radio, certainly not from French radio. Right. And, he, and not from Russians. <laughs> he doesn't speak Russian. February 1st, Russian communique. 14 German generals and two Romanian generals have surrendered. French radio news, quote, the Bolsheviks have not succeeded at all, unquote. The whole program is devoted to the conference of the peasant guild presided by the marshal, quote, in a blue gray suit, unquote. Mm -hmm. That's typical of Belt's irony. He just records this ludicrous detail, mm -hmm. right? After which the journal returns to Russia, quote, Germany and France, yesterday's victor and vanquished, would have the same fate, a horrifying fate, if Stalin were victorious. That victory would result in Muscovite hordes flooding into our country, unquote. These juxtaposed tidbits 
make a rather pretty montage, don't they? And that's the end of his entry. It's very surprising. This is a tremendous event in the war, and he knows that. Right? He's just a very ironic man. The next note, which is the same day, but it's a different note, just says, a few trains have been derailed. And that's an increasing theme in the diary. That is, every time a, the resistance has sabotaged a German troop train that has derailed it, he notes it. And there are lots of them. So you do feel the rise of resistance in the countryside. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Who was he writing the diary for and for what purpose? Oh, that's such a great question. And it's so hard to answer. Um, because that's a question that you can ask of, of any diary, and it's a very good question. Uh, the, the first answer that comes to mind, and I think it's true of any diary, really, is he's writing to keep a record of what happened. And that goes into the name of the diary. He called it Deposition. Here's my deposition of these years of Vichy, of the war. So that that's one reason. The other reason, frankly, I think is just to keep busy in his <laughs> in his house. He's a writer. He can't publish during the war, that's for sure. He has no desire to imagine a new novel. Mm -hmm. So he records life around him and which means what he can get from the radio, from the papers, from the station cafe where people are talking, from the people in the town, uh and especially also war news which filters through, as you can see. Mm -hmm. Uh Oh, here we have February 4th, which is the very end of the Battle of Stalingrad. And here he's quoting the Vichy paper. Quote, the Battle of Stalingrad is over. The Sixth Army succumbed to the numerical superiority of the enemy and the difficulties of the situation. Unquote. Special German communique. Without having gone to the war college, we can easily understand that if an army was vanquished, it's because it was beaten. And if it was beaten, it's because the enemy was stronger, braver, or more skillful. That is, mastered, quote, the difficulties of the situation, unquote, better. Hmm. So even there, his, his entry is just ironic about the way it's being reported in the Vichy press. Mm -hmm. The next day, he quotes de Gaulle, and he says, de Gaulle spoke this morning about Stalingrad, quote, the fury of despair, he said, a fine literary expression, is not a reality in war, unquote. The time will come for a national uprising. France will have the last word. Why isn't the legend of de Gaulle flourishing? Does de Gaulle lack something that is common to Napoleon and General Boulanger? General Boulanger was a very popular French general during the 19th century and almost became a dictator. Or is de Gaulle's legend hidden in people's hearts and will burst irresistibly into broad daylight? only at the shock of a national uprising. So he has revolutionary sympathies, which he associates with de Gaulle. That is, he thinks of a French revolution against the Germans, but he knows that's not going to come. Mm -hmm. But he becomes increasingly um, uh, almost enamored of de Gaulle, which is unusual in this very skeptical, anarchistic man and very left-wing, which de Gaulle certainly was not. Something I always wonder about, when people lived through this age is how much they realized that this was the break from old Europe to new Europe, to the new world order, because everything changed after that, you know, with the United Nations and just nuclear weapons and things just changed. And I wonder how, how aware anyone might've been that life wouldn't just continue the same afterwards, you know? Well, that's after the war and, after his diary, his diary ends at the liberation of Paris. Yeah. So I, I don't really know that it's an interesting question. Um, what he's worried about is what Hitler called the new order in Europe. Hmm. And the French collaborators uh, love that expression. Uh, there's and Pétain too used it all the time. I'm trying to build or rather to impose, he said, I'm now quoting Pétain from, from memory. I am now trying to build, or rather impose, a new order in France. That new order would have been a Nazi order. Mm -hmm. And that's what all of Europe uh, was trying to break out of, except the Nazis. Mm -hmm. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, who knows? They almost succeeded. Most, as you know, uh, almost all of Europe was occupied, all of Europe except for England. Mm-hmm. And North Africa was also occupied, right? Yeah. And I ask because, the you know, the irony he shows in his writings and his reporting, um, it, it just... It makes me wonder how much he was philosophizing about the future at all, if he did at all, or, again, you just say it was sometimes just straight reporting. Um, he, he was concerned about the future, and one of his concerns, which is a very realistic concern, was the possibility of a civil war in France, because in actual fact, you could say there was a civil war in France, although it wasn't large-scale fighting. Mm-hmm. 30,000 Frenchmen enlisted in the militia, la milice française. This was a paramilitary fascist organization that supported the Nazi rule in France. Their job was to hunt down resistance and to hunt down Jews. Mm. Uh, It's hard to know how many Frenchmen were in, and women, were in the resistance, you know, because they didn't carry cards. But historians' guesses are roughly equal to the number of those in the militia, maybe more. Maybe there were 50,000 in the resistance. That's just the active armed resistance, you know, or not necessarily armed, but those who risked their lives to send messages to the allies and things like that. So and there was fighting between the two. Uh, The militia, for example, tried to did really begin to clean out a pocket of armed resistance in the mountains, and Veldt records that in his diary uh, in, in the Alps, uh, except that eventually the Nazi, the German troops had to do it for them, they not enough to do it alone. Mm-hmm. So uh, he's often concerned about the possibility of a French civil war, which he does not seem to dread, unlike the other diary, Guénaud, who does see the possibility of a civil war and dreads it. He th- thinks, you know, that would be a horrible thing, which of course it would be would have been so he's 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 interested in the possibility uh, i mean he's concerned that by the possibility of civil war and he hopes for the idea of a general uprising in france against the nazis but he knows that's unrealistic that's not going to happen did you translate from the original diary or did you have a, a copy of it or something I, I had a copy of the book not the manuscript in either case okay but the, the 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 book itself was very carefully um, gone over, vetted, one might say, by the main French historian of the period, who's uh, Jean-Pierre Azema, uh, and he has notes to the book, which in the book, which I either use, I translate them and give his initials, or I cut them because they were just too long and wouldn't interest us, really. Um, or I made my own when there were things that a, an American reader wouldn't know, uh, but that he assumed a French reader would. Do you do you have any idea how um, how common diaries in France would have been for this period, or was it dangerous to keep a diary, you know, if you were caught writing something, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, there are some diaries of the period. I think I've translated. I've translated the ones, the main ones, really. The ones that historians quote most is not this one, but the Diary of the Dark Years by Gano, mm-hmm. because their historians, after all, are intellectuals and they're interested in intellectual collaboration and resistance, and that's what Gano was interested in. Mm-hmm. And plus, he has very quotable, eloquent sentences. They're who, as I say, was interested in life, daily life around him during the time, mo- during that time mostly. Um, but of course, if either diary had been found, uh, they would be dead men. Mm-hmm. And in Gano's diary, at one point he notes, I'm going to put these papers in a safe place which is kind of naive. What would be a safe place mm-hmm. <laughs> if they really searched his little apartment yeah. in Paris? And they never comments on the risk of keeping this diary, uh, but he gives people pseudonyms uh, in the diary. He doesn't use their real names for most of them, mm-hmm. although sometimes not for his friends, for example. He uses their real name. Mm-hmm. Uh, but once or twice, he says, uh, I'm going to put my shoe. I take note of where I put my shoes so if there's a knock on the door in the middle of the night, I don't have to run out barefoot, barefoot through the back. Mm-hmm. 
which actually happened to someone he knew in the village who just barely escaped with his life, and he was not writing a diary. Wait, did any Germans show up in the village while he was there, or was it all just French collaborationists who were the um, danger? Yeah, there were, there were some Germans in the village, uh, but they were just German troops who were either passing through, or at one point they uh, guard a, uh, a gas depot in, in the village, but they have no particular effect on the life of the village. They're not there, uh, except, you, you know, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It changes as time goes on, as the resistance rises. There are more and more night visits by the Gestapo, for example, to local houses, and more and more arrests as there are more and more derailments of trains in the countryside. And this is a very small village. So that, yes, people are arrested in the middle of the night, but these are not not from German troops. From the Gestapo, yes. What part of this work uh, was most enjoyable for you? Uh, the end. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because uh, because uh, during the war, one of the themes of this diary and the other diary, too, of any diary, would be, how is this going to end? Because it's not entirely clear until... I would say until Stalingrad, who is going to win this war? And the prospect of, you know, for living forever under German rule, under Nazi rule, is not something that somebody would relish. Yeah. So as the story unfolds and as he reports the war, which after the Normandy landing, it's lovely to see the steady advance to witness firsthand almost the steady advance of the Allied troops toward Paris eastward. And um, and finally, the end of Paris, the end, which is the uprising, and that that really is very exciting. Um, what did you discover as you were doing this? What what did you discover that was most surprising? I wasn't that surprised about most of it, to tell you the truth. Hmm. Uh, I was surprised how early on he knew about the concentration camps. I will say that because it was generally hmm. thought that. Um, very few people really knew about their existence. I mean, we know that the Allied commanders, both the British and the Americans, knew a great deal about them because they had been reported fairly early on by people who escaped and by members of the resistance in Poland. Um, but we didn't think that it was kind of common knowledge uh, so that was one thing. Uh, it, for example, November 4th, 1943, uh, he reports, he says this, Auschwitz, one would like to respond with equal tortures by a death whose torture lasts forever. And then we're crushed, anesthetized by that ultimate horror, by that infinite sadism. Never will the punishment equal the crime. Animals suffer less and die more quickly. Nothing can prevent this from having existed. Yeah. And then he changes the topic. And But later on, he he does not, how can I put it? He doesn't, he, neither Geno nor Welt hate the Germans as such. Really not. Hmm. As the Germans, no. Those who commit crimes, yes. Was there, um, you mentioned um, having some difficulty trying to figure out how you wanted to translate the word peasants. Were there any other uh, words or turn, uh, phrases that, that perhaps you struggled with to get the right uh, translation for? Uh, oh, yes, all the time. Hmm. But um, I don't even remember which because there are so many of them. Uh, you're constantly asking yourself as you translate, hmm. how am I going to phrase this? And then when you reread, you see with horror that you're too close to the French because we wouldn't really say this or that in English. Mm -hmm. But I can't give you any one example. Hey, I'm staring at something. My eye just falls on something, and I'll give you one example. Sure. I see. I see this uh, in the station cafe. This is this is his words. And on November 10th, 1943. This is right after the the entry about Auschwitz. November 10th in the station cafe. A liter of vin ordinaire costs 50 francs. A liter of white, 65 francs. A pound of butter, 100 francs. A liter of, of mark, 
Malk, I would say, 200 to 500 francs. These are all translation problems. Am I going to say a quart or a liter? Mm -hmm. I decided on a liter because we're in a different country. Vin ordinaire. Okay, I could have said ordinary wine. But vin ordinaire, first of all, it's this, you know it's like a separate class of wine in France. Mm -hmm. And also, I think anyone reading this, you know, ordinaire, let me pronounce it with an American accent, ordinaire. It looks like ordinary. Vin you probably know the word anyway, V-I-N, right? And it looks kind of like wine. I think you'd get it. So I'm going to leave that in French. Okay, 50 francs. But the next one, un litre de blanc in French. Well, not everyone's going to know the word that blanc means white. A liter of white. <laughs> okay, should I say white wine? No, he says, uh, he just says uh, un litre de blanc, a liter of white. We understand it's wine. A pound of butter. Now there I used our measurements, what he says is probably something like, uh, no, he, he, he does say in libo, which is a pound. Okay. Uh, a liter of Mark, M-A-R-C. Okay. Uh, do you know what, what Mark is, M-A-R-C? No. Okay. I don't think most people would. But I didn't want to say, uh, what am I going to say? A liter of brandy made from <laughs> <laughs> from grape Right. <laughs> from the dregs of grapes, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the word exists in English, so what the hell, I'll leave that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you can Google, yeah. You can Google it. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. So these are constant decisions all the time. So what do you hope the book will do? Uh, the first thing I hope the book will do is to give pleasure, <laughs> that mm -hmm. people will enjoy reading it. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second thing I hope the book will do was to give real information about what it was like to live in an occupied country, mm -hmm. and particularly in France at that time. Mm -hmm. And perhaps to dispel any last illusions any American might possibly have who's interested in the subject about Pétain mm -hmm. <laughs> and about Vichy. Yeah. And also to suggest that not everyone who felt with the resistance was lurking in the shadows with a submachine gun, mm -hmm. <laughs> that there are other attitudes and a whole range of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm just staring at something after the passage I read, and I'd love to read it. Could I? Oh, sure. Okay. This is an example of his reporting. November, first irony, and then just flat reporting, okay? November 11th, on the station platform, two officers, these are German officers, of course, right? On the station platform, two officers walk up and down, taking down the design of something or other. They seem swollen with lard, and they're not acting important for us. They don't see us. There's nobody on the platform. They're acting important for themselves. They smack down the heels of their boots and raise their heads. There are contradictions between those larded faces and that muscular tension, but that's the way it is. Then there's a space. Notice, the French nationals, Hubert Arnaud, student in Toulouse, two, Edmond Guillot, student in Toulouse, three, Jacques Sauvrin, student in Lardenne, four, André Vasseur, office worker in Toulouse, were sentenced to death October 24th, 1943, by a German military court for participating in terrorist acts. The condemned men had gathered in a mountain camp to fight German troops, where they were given weapons and military training. They fired to prevent the capture of the camp and cause losses among the German troops. The verdict was carried out by firing squad November 9th. Der Kommandant des Hertgebietes Südfrankreich. Now, there, my decision was to leave that in German because he leaves it in German. Mm -hmm. And the French, you know, you get you get what's going on. And then Verf just comments, those days, those nights between the sentence and the execution. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. So without him saying, my heart bleeds for these young men who are resistance and who are killed. Yeah. He just has that. Yeah. So did you have any difficulties getting getting the book finished or did it pretty much go according to plan um uh the difficulties i had are usually the same when i translate which is simply the struggle and i must say it's an enjoyable struggle it's like 
part of it is like solving a puzzle and part of it is an aesthetic pleasure mm-hmm. that the struggle to get things right to get things that sound the way they should the way i think they should mm-hmm. in english and that still gives the sense of what the, the what the, the what the book is saying in french and 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 how it feels to a french reader mm-hmm. so that's the kind of struggle i always have and i would not say it was any slower to translate than anything else on the contrary i think it was a little faster because i really kind of felt the book if you see what i mean mm-hmm. As if I were Veft writing in English somehow. <laughs> huh, interesting. Yeah. And and I apologize if you already mentioned this early on, but um, w- were you approached to do this, or did you pitch um, pitch it to the publisher to do this translation? Uh, you did not ask me that before. Uh, it's a good practical question. Uh, I pitched Gano to the publisher, the Oxford University Press, and they accepted it the way academic presses usually do when they accept that is that they send it to three outside readers. Mm-hmm. The readers make their reports and then the editorial board decides if they want to publish it. It's quite slow, but that's the way it works. And by the way, for an academic press it pays you anywhere from zero to a maximum of three thousand dollars for for doing this work. So mm-hmm. you don't do it for the pay, right? Mm-hmm. That's why most, you know, because they assume that their authors are professors with a day job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, <laughs> and publishing is, is part of what they do. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I'm a retired professor with a retirement, luckily. Mm-hmm. So I've earned a, a fat $3,000 for two years of work mm-hmm. on this book. But yes, I, I pitched the earlier diary to them, and then it was much easier to pitch this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't even remember if they used outside readers because they know me now. And um, the only problem was, okay, we're doing a second diary. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> we will, because this one's very different. Mm-hmm. And that was my pitch. Interesting. So what's your next uh, project? Uh, uh, I'm totally different. I have just finished a, a manuscript by a wild surrealist poet who was expelled from surrealism by excommunicated by the surrealists Mm -hmm. and he died at the age of 36 by out of from tetanus because he had inject he'd used a dirty needle to inject himself with morphine Mm -hmm. uh his name is roger gilbert le comte i guess roger gilbert le comte if you're speaking in a in an American accent, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's utterly different. These are wild poems, and the problems of translation are different. But I also annotated that, but at the back, so it doesn't look academic and with no footnotes. <laughs> so if there's something you don't understand, you can simply turn to the back and see the line. That might be difficult, um, and, you know, the, the allusion there. Mm-hmm. So it's a very, very different book, and it's for a totally different publisher. Mm-hmm. Okay. And now that we're um, coming to the end, you, you wanted to uh, read the the passages on the liberation of Paris. Yes. Of Paris. A, a little background on this, maybe before I start, he's going to mention, I'll say it in English, the uh, uh, the FFI, and then I'm going to pronounce it in French, the FFI. That's the Force Française de l'Intérieur, literally the French forces of the interior. That was a recently created military force led by de Gaulle with American money and they had American tanks uh, to part of the free French, if you will. That is the French who were against the Nazi occupation, were willing to fight and were outside of France, not the inner resistance. Okay, Mm -hmm. but they kind of joined with the resistance. So when he says the FFI, that's what you'll understand. Okay. Okay. Um, August 15th, there's a rumor that the police are on strike. No details. Message from the military governor of Paris, General von Schultitz, about order, food, and security in the capital. A strange text written in uncertain French and full of involuntary admissions. General von von Schultitz admits fearing terrorist, that is, resistance, activity. Uh, A little pause there. Uh... The words that the Germans always used for the resistance and the words that Vichy used for the, what we call resistance and what they called resistance was terrorist. Mm. 
I think it's interesting to reflect on. It is. One man's terrorist is another's resistor. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, a few clear images remain after reading. An invincible Germany whose means of transportation are hardly bothered by sabotage. A kindly Germany that provides Paris with electricity. Mm. An implacable Germany determined to exercise, quote, the severest, even the most brutal repression, unquote. But also a hesitant Germany which, quote, pleads with us. August 15th again. Big headline in the Petit Parisien, which was a daily published under Nazi control in French, written by French people. Intense fighting in the Chartres-Dreux region. Now, Chartres is about 90 miles from Paris, right? So you, you get what that means if there's fighting there. Mm-hmm. Intense fighting in the Chartres-Dreux region. But the people say, they're in Chartres, they're in Dreux. A poster on the facade of the police station at saint sulpice that's in Vert's neighborhood, the 6th arrondissement, the Latin Quarter. The police are with the population of Paris. They've joined three centers of resistance, three centers of resistance. 97% of the policemen are no longer obeying the Gestapo agent, the French Gestapo agent. Hard to explain why the Germans haven't destroyed these posters. Rumor, the Americans will be in Paris tonight. Another rumor, postal strike. At five o'clock, the poster is still on the wall of the police station. August 19th, a few isolated shots in the night, fairly near us. Radio at half past midnight. Montgomery now declares the Battle of Normandy has been won. A little later in, in August 19th, the French flag is raised over the Hôtel Dieu and the pre- Prefecture of Police. Hôtel Dieu is a big hospital in Paris. Mm-hmm. Fighting at the bottom of Boulevard Saint-Michel. The concierge of the building where the Crayers live was wounded in the leg while she was closing the carriage entrance. She was taken to the hospital. August 20th. Shots fired from Boulevard Montparnasse last night and from the Rue de Rennes later in that same day. I don't know what the news is on the street, but the street is different from the way it was the other nights. Not excited and tense, but in a state of calm beatitude. Groups gather in front of the doorways, larger than usual and denser, too, as if swollen. The children aren't playing and don't disperse. They're waiting for the great event to appear in the flesh, the visible flight of the Germans, the passage of an American tank. A phonograph is playing the Marseillaise. Now, the Marseillaise was, of course, forbidden during those four years. Flags pop out at the windows, briefly hiding a chest or a face, which disappears instantly into the darkness. Applause spreads and glides along like flowing water between the asphalt and the facades of the buildings. A flag has been raised on the roof of the house where a German anti-aircraft battery used to stand. The evening of this summer Sunday is warm and sultry. It feels like a July 14th risen from the grave. And July 14th, any reader would have learned by now, is the French what we call Bastille Day, our July 4th, right? Mm -hmm. There's a sudden drop in the tension of my form of my long four year wait. Hmm. Yeah. August, yeah, <laughs> August 21st, 10 p.m. A sound like a roll of far off thunder breaking the silence. The whole street says it's them. August 23rd, two tanks were captured on Place Maubert by the FFI, the FFE. Something's changed. We don't analyze every ring of the doorbell anymore. August 24th. Now he's going to mention Claude. That's Claude, if you will. That's his son. Mm. Right. Belt is now 66. So his son is a young man. August 24th. Who and Claude spent five minutes at the house. They immediately went back to Place Saint-Michel to their post in the FFI in jackets and with blackened hands. Can you guess why they had blackened hands? Hmm. No, well, no, not at the moment. Okay, it's from building barricades. Ah, okay. And the reason why he just says that with no explanation is that I think French readers would have got that, both because they knew barricades went up and because in the revolt of the Paris Commune in 1871, uh, the 
when they found working people with black with blackened hands, they asked to see their hands, and then they arrested and shot them, mm. or just shot them. So that's a real that's that's heavy with resonance. That little detail of blackened hands, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. We're told militiamen and Doriotistes are firing from the rooftops. I told you about the militia. Doriot was another French fascist. Hmm. Are the Americans at the Porte d'Orléans, or aren't they? The Porte d'Orléans is the southwest entrance to Paris. Two German armored cars with machine guns mounted on them go down Rue de Rennes toward the Boulevard Saint-Germain. The gunners are looking up at the facades, ready to fire. Tense, nervous faces. A tank is stopped by a barricade in front of the Hotel de Lutetia. It maneuvers, backs up, and fires three cannon shots at the barricade, no doubt, and disappears. The noise of the explosions filled the sound corridor of Rue de Rennes. As soon as the noise stopped, the groups in the doorways, who had gone back inside, reappear. We can see bouquets of faces at the windows again. I don't know how we learned that two tanks of General Leclerc had pulled up in front of the Hôtel de Ville. Okay, now there you need my note, no doubt. General Leclerc was one of the few French generals who joined de Gaulle in London with the free French. And he was allowed by the Americans, actually, to command the second armored division of French and American tanks. So they set a Leclerc tank, which had, which, because it's commanded by Leclerc, uh, and it had a French tricolor flag on it. It was actually an American tank painted over. Hmm. So, and and they were the first French sort of regular troops to reach Paris, and the first troops to reach Paris, actually. Hmm. I don't know how we learned that two tanks of General Leclerc had pulled up in front of the Hôtel de Ville. Hôtel de Ville is town hall, the mayor. mayor. Around 8 p.m., D and his wife ring our bell. D takes us to the Hôtel de Ville. He doesn't want to wait till tomorrow to breathe the air of a delivered Paris in the street. Hmm. Breathe in Paris, but not see it. To see Paris is out of the question. It's pitch blackout. We hear cannon and gun salvos till dawn. August 25th. The Germans are firing from the Luxembourg Gardens. Machine gun fire and rockets. In the afternoon, the shelling grows more violent. Meanwhile, a Leclerc tank emerging from Rue Vavin, that's a street right near the Luxembourg, fires on the blockhouse Rue Guinemail. It destroys it in two shots. Right after the explosions, the windows are filled with faces, and from every window, people are shouting, Bravo! They're clapping as if it were shooting practice or an orchestra performance. <laughs> Applause bursts out from every corridor of the street. My nose is glued to the window. I see the line of a tracer bullet light up and go out. The tank rolls up Rue d'Assas, stops at the corner of Rue Auguste Comte in front of the Lycée Montaigne, and fires at the sandbags piled up at the corner. A German throws a jerry can of flaming gasoline at it, but it doesn't reach the tank, which has already started moving. Later, we have a procession of tanks. Each tank is covered by a human swarm. German prisoners are standing, squeezed flank to flank, belly to back, all with their hands at the back of the, on the back of their necks. Never will I forget those men with their hands clasped over the napes of their necks, those caryatids in faded uniforms in the posture of the damned. One of them, hardly an adolescent, has let his head fall on his neighbor's chest. He's sleeping. Victory. Tears come to my eyes. Tears of deliverance. But I am moved by the obvious striking contradiction. These terrible, heavy machines did the work of justice. Through them, the nuances of human thought have been preserved. No, I'm not afraid of these big ideas, and I don't care if they make some people smile. These tanks going by are giving me my share of victory, my share of freedom. My joy is too strong. It's a joy I can't keep inside me for long without spoiling it. But the humiliation of those men makes me suffer. It is necessary. It is even justice itself. I approve of it. It satisfies me. It soothes me. And I cannot rejoice at it. August 26th. A few houses down the street. They just cropped the hair off the heads of four women. 
the hair is in the gutter. They're going to parade these four women through the streets. A procession accompanies them with a kind of dignity without shouting. But an old man spits in their faces and wants to hit them. He is prevented from doing it. Uh, you understand that they were suspected of sleeping with the Germans during the occupation. Right. They, yeah, they called it horizontal collaboration. The shaved heads of those women, and one of them had a clayey face with dilated eyes. I once saw them on a condemned man they were taking to the guillotine. De Gaulle is walking down the Champs-Élysées. A lapping of shouts and murmurs rises from the waiting crowd. When he appears, all those cries and all those murmurs fuse into one wave, hardly oscillating at all and filling the whole space between earth and heaven. Hmm. And that's the end of the diary. And the last entry that I read on August 26th, that's the whole entry. So he first has two paragraphs on the shaved heads of the women, which he, without saying it, you get that this is not something he likes to see and approves of. Mm -hmm. And the next paragraph is that the one poetic passage in the whole diary where he lets himself go. And he's actually lyrical about that victory procession down the Champs-Élysées. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, complexity, that contradiction is typical of the diary, just as his, just as he, his tears come to his eyes at the victory, but he feels terrible about those German prisoners. He knows this is what should be done. It's just. Yeah. It, it, that's the way it should be. But they're humiliated. This is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's a very compl He's a very complex man, and I think you get that in the diary. In, in that sense, it also gives you the emotional satisfaction of reading a good novel, if you see what I mean. Yeah. It takes you into human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where can people find the book then and uh, your, your other works? Do you have a web page, social media, anything like that? I don't have a web page, no. You can, but if you Google Deposition, uh, Leon Vert, you'll get it. If you go to Oxford University Press, you'll get it. Um, you'll get both, both of them. Uh, if you Google Diary of the Dark Years, you'll get it. And you also get a great review in the New York Times, which I was very glad to get. Mm. Uh, the Diary of the Dark Years. Uh, so that's what you can do. Okay. <laughs> I can't help you any more than that. No, that sounds good. Um, all right. Well, that's that's all I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? No, I think I just delivered them to you when I commented on that last passage, okay. except I want to thank you for this opportunity to talk about a book I love. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. This podcast has been presented by War Scholar. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com for more great interviews and military history information. Your visits help support this podcast. One of the best ways to provide feedback for this podcast is to rate me on iTunes. Please give me a good rating if you liked it, or feel free to give me a bad rating if you didn't. I'll use that feedback to make this a better podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram under Chris Alvarez War Scholar. That's Chris without an H, C R I S. On Facebook under War Scholar. On YouTube under War Scholar 1945. And on Twitter under War Scholar. Thank you, and I hope you return to this podcast for more great military history.